Hello and welcome back to the Schooner Pod. I'm Bobby Howard. With me, we've got Jameson Maxwell and Ty Lee, and we are here to catch up a little bit because uh, if you've been paying attention to the feed recently, a lot of college basketball, uh, as you know, um, not a lot to talk about on the OU front on either end as uh, uh, Jenny Branchek's uh, women have been eliminated last night. Because they can't, and, can't uh, play post-defense. It's just as simple as that. No post-defense. Uh, yeah, the, we, do, we don't need to dissect it, but it was not great. Pretty bad finish. Uh, and Porter Moser's uh, OU team has clearly been left out for quite a while. So it's time to get back to basics. It's time to finally talk about some football. I know y'all have been clamoring for it, wanting it. But uh, frankly, you know, the off season we get a little busy. We're doing some other stuff, and uh, I don't know about you, Jameson. I feel like it's been a little weird this off season. Not a ton of news, just little bitty oh. bits. Ty, I don't know. What, what do you What do you think, Ty? What do you think? Ty? I, I think Bobby is intentionally putting the schooner in front of the boomer and sooner on this one. Um, it is not yet time to talk about football, Bobby. Please give the people an update as of, oh, it's 5.35 in the evening for me on uh, 3.26. Uh, please give the people an update on the standings of the Schooner Pod Bracket Challenge for March Madness. They would like to know specifically who was in last place. Oh, it's awful. It's a bloodbath. <laughs> if y'all listen to well, first of all, if you listen to the main show, you would know that me, Jameson, and Blake did an awful job. Uh, but one specifically did worse because all, like a couple of those long shot, you know, 12 seeds that I really, really liked. Oh yeah. They didn't turn out too good. <laughs> so ours. Is, so mine is like a worse version of an already atrocious bracket. Um, it's, it's bad folks. It is, it is gnarly for, I, I, for those. I don't, I don't want to cut you off. No, I, I tell you got, I'm just saying, I haven't even looked at it and like, Probably I, since day one. I was going to say, for those that are curious, the Schooner Pod aggregate bracket is third to last. Uh, last is currently Bobby. Second to last is, in fact, Boat and Blake. So the, <laughs> the ball knowers, ball knowers uh, know something that we do not know. Uh, but shout out to good friends of the pod, Michael Whitman and uh, Tyler Caldwell are currently uh, one and two. Actually, Tyler and I are tied for two right now but shout out to good friends of the pod that's that's good to see you but yeah i i missed out on the making of that one so i like to i like to say that maybe we'd bump it up a little bit more but i don't know the the group brackets always tend to go awry morehead state should have had it just bad coaching not from the players just bad coaching it's okay we'll, we'll be better next year yeah not not mad at morehead they did their best um you know what? What can you say? Sometimes, sometimes it hits. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, in, in this case, it didn't. And you know, I, I think our biggest problem is abandoning San Diego State in their time of need, Jameson. That is true. That is true. I, not enough believers in the Aztecs who mm -hmm. are who are onto the Sweet Sixteen, much to Boat and Blake's chagr uh, chagrin. Which I love that. Um, yeah. Let's talk. Let's talk football. Which is weird to say because yes. we haven't done it in a while. But I think the biggest thing that's happened recently, and we can kind of touch a little bit, a little bit on Cruden, and a little bit on Portal near the end of this podcast. Um, but spring is approaching. But SEC randomly threw down the, hey, we're going to release next year's schedule just out of the blue when there's a lot going on right now in the sports world. There could have been much better times for marketing for them to release that make it a bigger event but now i know why it's because they wanted it to just be super boring and go under the covers like people are like oh they should have done another time no they knew that just flipping the schedule is going to be boring is going to get a lot of bad press so they thought that they could sweep it under the rug with march madness going on and to be honest it's fine it's fine but i'm a little disappointed Look, you got to give them credit for knowing when to make an hour or two hour long special and when not to. Because if they actually did like a, a show about it, we would have all been really pissed off. So mm -hmm. just a random weekday drop works. But um, yeah, the 2025 schedule, uh, one, not going to nine conference games, uh, stay, uh, sticking at eight. And two, it's just a, it's just a inverse. It's a flip of uh, what we saw in 24. So 
um, going to Tennessee, Alabama, and South Carolina, and then getting return visits from Auburn, uh, Ole Miss, Missouri, and uh, Alabama. Or sorry, not Alabama, but um, LSU. So I, I think the matchups are interesting. We'll talk about that in a bit. But it, in a way, it really sucks for OU fans in, in, in a way because it's a brutal schedule absolute b- brutal especially when you add in michigan coming to town as well um so what was already a pretty tough schedule with michigan got a little bit worse um but also oh my god the amount of like brands and insanely cool schools coming to norman that's going to make your season ticket damn well worth it uh mm-hmm. especially fresh off a of season where our marquee home game was probably tcu iowa state West Virginia I, I I don't know so I think it's a breath of fresh air in some sense exciting to see that but from a competitive standpoint that is really tough yeah I mean it's well it's yet to be seen right it's it's hard to project where these teams are going to be this year let alone two seasons from now I, I know like right now we touch on Alabama and Michigan but you're talking about teams that are both going to be two years after losing, you know, pretty significant coach. I mean, you're losing a national championship coach at, at both of those organizations. So obviously, you know, expect kind of a hit in the first year, but I think in the second year, I think both of those tremendous, tremendous brand recognition, I'm not advocating for, I, w- I just want to play easy games. Obviously that's not why we went to the sec, but um, you know, year two, I think you really start to see like recruiting take effect and, and everything else, even if the new coaches come in and, and do really, really well, it's you just have different street cred when it comes to recruiting and when it comes to retaining players in the portal era that I, I could see both of those teams, you know, being kind of insignificant. Maybe, right? I'm not trying to get this clipped by someone from another school. At the same time, you know, LSU obviously trending in the right direction. Tennessee, who knows with that? South Carolina, you know, great coach over there. Tennessee is going to be coach good. Beamer, so. They're yeah, going to be really good. That's going to be uh, – Nico Yamaleva's uh, junior season before he goes first round pick. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. they're going to be a buzzsaw. And Alabama and LSU are always going to be good. Like, it is going to be a tough schedule. Oh, yeah. It's going to be brutal. And, you know, it, OU fans know, like, how intense Newland Stadium is. And, you know, there's some recent history there with, you know, uh, the Baker Mayfield team going in there. I say recent, like, that is it going to be on the 10 year anniversary? of that game, but still it's, it's, it's still in your mind. Um, so it's a, I, I think you get a little bit of an easier deal on the road. I, I think this current, the 24 uh, schedule is a lot harder just given the caliber of road games being as tough as they are, but like Carolina brings a good environment, but not exactly the best team. Tennessee will be a good team. Great environment. That's going to be a mess. Alabama, we don't know where, what they'll be. And, you know, frankly, they're gonna I'm not... Be good. They're going to be good. They're be recruiting good. starting to pick up again. The, all of the bad press of the Nick Saban and people thought they were going to digress a little bit. They're picking right back up. Yeah, but that that crowd doesn't exactly startle me. You know what I mean? I, they really? feel not to the degree of like a Death yeah. Valley or a this Neyland. This is getting clipped. This is gonna get clipped really? or whatever. That's that's just bad take, Bobby. That no, that's scary. not a bad take. They might not be the top of the. They might not be top two, top three, but they should be scary. A- Alabama, no, Alabama as a team scares me. But the yes, crowd and their isn't crowd. exactly. And the, yeah, and their crowd. They're, well, like OU's crowd doesn't necessarily scare me. It wouldn't scare me either. Like same with kind of a Texas home crowd at times. It feels a little bit too pampered. You know, a little bit like they've. I do. They've seen. You know, they don't have that that panicked energy of a, of an LSU hmm. or a Tennessee. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense or not. I I don't, mm, I don't a hundred percent disagree. I, the OU crowd, not scaring you. You know, that's kind of a cold take. I stand with the fans, right? Some people on this pod don't support the fans. I support the fans. <laughs> uh, so I think OU is the toughest place to play. And this is not a bit I've been longstanding standing. LSU is not a tough place to play. Objectively, it is uh, not. Like, pull the record, right? No, but it's the same argument that y'all, you have for Bama, right? Take. It's like they just schedule 
cheap opponents like LSU's reputation, what they'd be, they beat Dak Prescott and Mississippi state there. Like, Oh, you want it home against Dak Prescott. That, that makes it a tough place to play NFL proven. That's not, that's not a thing. So you just wanted to talk about Dak. I wasn't even, I was trying to do a whole bit about defending the fans and how some people don't defend the fans and DC insider Jameson and all that. And then I just, my, I can't, the instincts can't be fought. It's, we will find a way to squeeze in a Dak is not good and LSU is not a tough place to play every podcast. Yeah, that's just wrong. Sure. It's going to be it's going to be a tough place to play. It, it's just simple as that. LSU is going to be tough. Alabama is going to be tough. Tennessee is going to be tough. We don't have to compare them. They're all going to be tough. It's different levels of tough, though. I, I think there are levels to it. And I think Alabama, I'm not saying it's not going to it's going to be easy. I just I. I, I don't know if they bring it environment wise the same way some other spots in the SEC do. I, I, oh, I just hit my mic. So sorry, people. Um, uh, I will say this. Now, are you using tough as in like you know Tennessee fans are just some crazy mofos? So whenever you're in the stands, it might be tough as a Sooner fan in the stands because Tennessee's going to go crazy. LSU fans are going to go crazy. Alabama fans, whenever it gets you know, tight. Whenever it's a good game, it gets loud in there. And that's really what it comes down to. It doesn't really matter as much of how crazy your fans are, or how belligerent they are in the stands. It matters how loud it gets, and it gets pretty loud in Tuscaloosa. Well, yeah, but like what crowds don't get loud in big games close? You know what I mean? Like that's that's like kind of, yeah, par for the course everywhere. But it's hmm. it's the it's the front to back you know, can you get loud the entire, entire way? Like Tennessee is a different environment than, Hmm. you know, like how Baylor can get loud for a big game in the fourth quarter. You know, that doesn't make them like a special environment. Um, Yeah. Alabama's got, it's it's got one of the eight stadiums in college football that have over a hundred thousand seats. So just another aspect of that. No, it's going to be big, but it's not necessarily like intimidating in the same way as like, and Ty's gonna yell at me over this one. Like no. Penn State. No, Penn State, that's that's not a cold take. Penn State, the crowd is tougher than the team. Every yeah. time. Yeah. Easy. And I um I, yeah. And I think it could be a little different now that you know I'll, like a year after saving, you know, some of that hungriness might return. I, I don't know. But I, I feel like Alabama might suffer from a lot of the same issues that OU deals with, where you know, Mima and Peepa don't want you standing up, you know, because they they can't see the ball game, you know, stuff like that. I, I do. I, this comes to mind. Um, Jameson, you know, is over here. DC insider Jameson defending <laughs> LSU as a, as a tough place to play on an OU podcast. I, for one personally would like to see Jameson's birth certificate and see where hmm. his allegiance lies. Uh, because I, I'm not not questioning his allegiance to Oklahoma, but you know there have been sleeper mm-hmm. agent accusations on the podcast before, hey, and I think we may have no Louisianans. It's just as simple as that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I think big picture, all in all, it's kind of disappointing from a fan standpoint right now because we really like as newcomers to the SEC. You know, I really wanted to see something new. You know, maybe you get a chance to get to Florida. Um, you know, stuff like that. Um, but you know, from an overall perspective of it, it's just part of it. There's going to be plenty of time in the sec. And does this set up to, we're going to move towards a nine conference series the the following series, like the following year, you know, like I know that it's kind of been like, they've been putting in the, the work for that. Um, and with the way that college football is going right now, I wouldn't be surprised if they start inching towards that. I, I think they held out just to see what the sport becomes, you know, with the yeah. thoughts of expanding the playoff again. And I think that's a smart, prudent move. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I think they definitely need to do nine conference games. I I get that some schools, you know, want that extra game to be a home game and, you know, get some garbage team in there, collect the gate, whatever. Mm-hmm. But uh, it just... An extra an extra SEC game, I think, brings in more dollars, more better better games, bigger environments. I mean that that we we you want that. And not only that, it's the only conference to not have nine um nine conference games, I believe. Mm-hmm. And that's just I, that's just a bad look. 
Look, we, we, we've cr we've critiqued the SEC for years. Now that mm. we're in the SEC, we can't can't not critique them for for do ducking the smoke. That's kind of a lame move. It is. Now listen to me, Ty, because I think you can get a, like on board with this. We need to expand the SEC season to be longer. It starts before all of college football. And the only reason we would do that, because everyone in the SEC is worried about if you play nine conference games, it's going to be too tough. We make Vanderbilt play every single team in the SEC, and they'll be the only team that plays every single team in the SEC. And that will allow us to pad our schedule just a little bit. And they'll just be the fall guys. Commodore in the ring. <laughs> Vanderbilt with a six Vanderbilt with a 16 or sorry, no, 15 game schedule. <laughs> they, they, have to, they, have to, they have to play. They have, sometimes they play on Thursday and Saturday. <laughs> I don't want to play again. Well, that's too damn bad, Vanderbilt. <laughs> they finish the know, season on man. like their sixth string quarterback. You know, they're, they're bringing in dudes from IMs. I, I personally, right, it's, this is not just to be the dissenting take here, but I, I personally don't hate the eight conference teams thing, especially with the SEC being sort of regional, because it, I think it opens up more as we continue on you know, you can get that sort of micro regionality and like looking at OU's, you know, 2025 schedule, obviously a lot of these places were not going to them, but you know, Illinois state, like getting some Midwest in there, Michigan, same thing, getting some, some Midwest in there, obviously big football places going to temple, obviously not a problem. Then Kent state. Um, I know as of recent has been a, a regular opponent on, on OU schedules, maybe just one time. And I have a weird recency bias, but I, I know it's happened at least one time. So, um, but I, I do kind of enjoy that if I don't know what the methodology is behind that and, and if that will change, but I, I do enjoy the, you know, like before they went to the, the ACC, you know, like play SMU, play the smaller schools that are sort of around you. I really enjoyed every time we got to play Tulsa and, and things like that. I just, I think that's neat. And I think that opens up maybe a little bit more opportunity to get little things like that. And then I like the, I, I do like, I know I've changed up on this, but the little SEC sort of midway through play a random opponent. And then of course the marquee matchups, but I think with the landscape that college football is moving to, especially with the expanded playoff, it, I think it does make sense. I, I feel like you will see other conferences move to this before you see the SEC move mm -hmm. up to nine. And I think, I, I think talking about that little micro regionality um, aspect, I, I feel like in order to keep regionality within the conference, you kind of need that extra game so you can protect more rivalries um, because under eight games, Texas essentially can't have OU and Texas A&M. Uh, they couldn't have Arkansas as well. And it, or like you, you just have to find a system that allows, you know, schools that are close to each other to play each other because it's it's a pretty big footprint now and you know OU like our closest schools are Missouri Arkansas and Texas A&M if you don't count Texas which is Dallas um but we're so, playing none of them on rivalry week right big LSU. yeah well apparently apparently LSU is our new rivalry week rival uh Stupid. if if that's to believe I love it's, that it's dumb <laughs> I've told you guys this before. I, back when the SEC thing was announced, we we did a whole thing about like who who do we want to be like a sort of new rival? And it, to me, it was always LSU. It's one of the more drivable ones to a big school. It has the engaged fan base. It like you just get the ton of discourse. Like it's just there's history there with the programs on a big stage. It, it makes and then there were broadly similar a lot of the time, like LSU is, is consistently pretty, I just think it's a perfect, perfect fit in. So I'm excited for that. I keep trying to force it. I understand if people, there's no history there it, as a rival. So I think there's a history of dislike though, uh, you know, from that 2003 national title. But from... Everyone feels that in college football. And the thing is like LSU is just like the Patrick Beverly of college football. Like everyone hates them. That's fair, but like they did something to us, and people still have like their kind of. And I don't even know if that's true because I feel like with the Burrow thing, they were kind of likable. They're like a like um, they're like a likable good version of Texas Tech, where they're rowdy and wild, and you know I think some people admire it 
you know, they, they're like, oh, we, we don't want to be exactly that. But I mean, look at, look at how many people are like copying neck and, you know, wanting to take on some of that LSU culture. I, I think in a way that's admired, but in a way there's like this kind of clash where it's like a little bit oil and water, you know, with OU and um, LSU, because there's like this kind of more buttoned down tradition with OU and LSU is just craziness. And, you know, I, I think that kind of clashes at times. Um, and whenever it has clashed, it's, you know, it's, it's clashed. Um, so I, I could see it. I could see it, but I, I personally think they're more, I, I think Arkansas could, could get a little spicy there. They have a lot of hatred towards OU for, for no reason. Yeah. And that's good. That's kind of my bummer with the with that's with the, the one that makes is. sense. I, I wish we got Arkansas A and M in year two, just because of mm. proximity. I think that would have been fun. That's really one of my only gripes. But um, before we move on from scheduling, Jameson, I did want to say, you know, we we talked before the show a little bit about Carolina being kind of close to you on the east uh, eastern seaboard. Temple, though, you know, Philadelphia, not far. Oh, you're right. I didn't even think about that. Now that's yeah. actually an opportunity right there. Yeah, Ooh. Ooh, is is Temple that. not in Texas? No, well, there is a Temple, Texas. <laughs> there is a Temple, Texas, but Temple is from Philly. Is in Philly. They play mm. at link at the link. Uh, now that is but, an opportunity. I might have to yeah. do that. No, that's that that is a move that is. Uh, yeah, I didn't think about that till just now, but that could be that could be fun. That could be fun. Um, yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. We we have a whole year until we mm. talk about twenty five. But uh, definitely worth a worth a chat, worth a talk. Um, you know, I know we're a little late on this, but you know, for for the record, I was thinking of rice. It's fair. <laughs> There's still a temple. They're both, they're, well, well, they're, the both, they're both owls. They're both you know? owls. Mm-hmm. They're both they have owls. similar colors. colors. Nah, they're both quite primary. Opposite. Both no. primary colors. One's red and one's blue. <laughs> It's like quite quite the opposite. They're like they're like inverted versions of each other. So I, I'll 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 I'm no, gonna no, try to give you don't, that. Don't give them that. I'm just gonna stop you. Yeah, let's okay. let's just move on and let's kind of talk about spring. And I don't want to get too much into breaking down each position group because we'll do that in our spring game preview the week of 420, baby. Um, the spring game. Um, but I just think that there's a couple of talking points that we can have for like what to watch now that spring football is underway. And there's on the offense side and defense side, I feel like big holes and things that we really need to make sure we start to hear some good things. Cause remember guys in the spring, you will only hear good news, but when you hear nothing, that's really the bad news. When you don't hear about certain players, that's when you worry. You won't hear anything bad about players because that's just a normal thing whenever you're at this point. But you want to hear positive things. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's that's true. That's the thing with talking season is, you know, everyone looks good against air and practice dummies. But, you know, um, you can also look, if you look bad, that's, that's pretty bad. But no one's going to say that. You know, that's not how, that's really not how these practices, you know, work. And I mean, there have been, and to be fair, there have been times where we've heard good things and they don't turn out that way. And, you know, you get to the spring game and they kind of bust a little bit. So. Well, like last spring, remember how many times we were talking about, and then even going into the fall and summer, we were like, who is wide receiver one? We talked about that all the time. And we we're like, it should be Jalil Farouk, but I haven't seen anything, no insider, bo- no, none of the message boards, no articles talking about Jalil Farouk, what's going on? And what we saw is a guy who has the talent, but going into the season, a disappointment. So it kind of matches up. So like the, a guy like Farouk again, if he has another quiet off season, I'm going to be disappointed. He needs to step in. I understand Dion Burks is going to be our number one guy. It's just as simple as that. The dude is talented and that's why we went out and got him. But we need to hear more from Jalil Farouk this spring because he needs to step up and be an alpha guy. And we have doubts. Can he even be an alpha? Well, and I mean, that room's pretty, it's pretty stacked. I mean, you're losing Drake Stoops, but you know, Andrew Anthony's back. Nick Anderson, like a lot of positivity there. Um, 
So maybe not on the, on the, is, on the outside. Yeah. I don't think it's really that stacked. That's fair. Ty, what do you think? I think that's kind of a kind of a cold take to say as far as this season right now, OU's receiver room isn't stacked. I mean, it's it's good. It's, it's not like deep. Yeah, but people de- it's it's receiver at the college level. Like it's people develop. And unless you're Farouk, it's not that hard. It's truly not that hard. You know, so it's it'll be interesting to see. Getting out of positions, right? My position changes, but I did have a quick programming note. You said that no one ever looks bad or loses in the spring. Um, Tate Martell made his whole career <laughs> on just losing in the spring and then transferring. So uh, deep reference. For, not that deep of a reference, but uh, RIP Tate Martell. Dude would have been maybe the highest paid college football player ever if he had just been born like two years later and could have NIL'd all his transfers. Yeah, it's, it's just like the thing is with this wide receiver room that makes this spring interesting is you're going to have Dion Burks in the slot, and you're going to feel very, very comfortable about that. You know Jalil Farouk is going to be kind of all over the place. You know he's going to be out there. Um, you say Andrew Anthony, but that dude's going to miss the spring. So he's going to be a late bloomer, and everyone responds from injury in different ways. You can't slot him in as a guy that's going to automatically start to contribute like he was near you know, the beginning and middle of the season last year. So it comes down to if Joe Farouk's not going to be that guy, which I think is the biggest story going into next season in terms of wide receiver. I understand Dion Burke's going to be a fun story, but I think the biggest story in terms of our success and Jackson Arnold's success is can uh, Farouk be that guy? But can, you know, Jaden Gibson take another step up? You know, like we saw a small step from him, but can he just not be a big play wide receiver? Just do a go route and go get a ball. Can he do something else other than that? You know, or is there going to be another guy that's like farther down the depth chart that we're going to see more? Like Brennan Thompson, is he only going to be a deep ball guy? Can he do something else? Hell, could we put Jaquay's Petaway out on the outside instead of the slot? Because that slot room is going to be busy. Like, we need to see something. Petaway is a guy I really want to see more out of. I, I, mm-hmm. I, I we, we saw a little bit, not too much. But, you know, highly ranked guy, um, you know, recruiting wise, I, I I think he's an exciting prospect that I would love to see a lot more of. Um, Gibson, you're talking about him as a guy who could progress. I really like like that guy's, you know, trajectory. I love, you know, kind of a bigger body. I, I'm, I'm I, w- I would like Gibson to do well. Mm-hmm. And I, I think we already know what we're going to get out of um out of Nick Anderson too. I think that's just like a given. We know that. It's it's really it's just who's going to be the other outside wide receiver. What do you what do you think? You you disagree no. with me? No, we don't. We do not know what we're going to get out of Nick Anderson. I know, and I know that halfway through October, you guys are going to be saying, "We should have listened to Ty. Should have listened to Ty about Nick Anderson. Should have listened." I let me turn back the clock on the Schooner Pod. These guys didn't even know about Ryan Broyles until I was like on the podcast every day. Like, no, you guys need to pay attention to this guy. Pay attention to this guy. He's going to be a good receiver. That was a bit of a joke. But who was the first to get on the CD Lamb train? Me. Everyone was Hollywood this, Hollywood that, Hollywood, Hollywood, Hollywood. I said, no, this guy is the best one. He's going to be the best one in the league. We were right. Right, everyone was on the Rambo train. I was like, "Hey, be careful about this train; it could derail." Who was right? Right, I was right on those. So I thought you were on the Rambo train. Yeah, I, I remember. I was, and then I, then I talked to him in Dale one time, and he said he was going to get four touchdowns in whatever <laughs> game was next. And I was like, "No, no, he's Uh-oh. not. This is not." I have I made like, a horrible mistake. Icarus. I was like, "We got Icarus right here." It's he had like one touchdown and the thing before on like one reception he did trigger my it's better to be wr2 thing but then he became wr1 full icarus mode and we all know how that turned out but nick anderson is going to be the best receiver on the team he's going to be right like let's i'm gonna pull his stats obviously the the line is a little misleading but 38 receptions two yards shy of 800 yards average of 21 on 38 receptions is insane with 10 touchdowns again again that's a fourth of the time, a little over the fourth of the time he touched the ball last year on almost 40 receptions, he scored a touchdown. That is an insane line for a freshman on a team of OU's caliber. 
and I understand, right, we all had our, our negative things to say about OU last year, but he was playing with a quarterback who, I'm not trying to get into this bit, but a quarterback that couldn't actually play to his strengths, and then he was playing with a quarterback that was just completely unprepared for their situation in, uh, you know, in Arnold in the bowl game. So obviously Nick Anderson had some issues last year, but his upside, and I feel like getting so much game experience last year, sophomore year is a big year for receivers, especially if they get a ton of play time. And I feel like he has fixable issues that if Arnold can iron stuff out, he will be absolutely electric like he was when he first came out. Cause Nick Anderson is a guy that can get those deep. If Arnold can sort out, accuracy you know and and running through his evolutions and stuff it, nick anderson is gonna be dangerous you're talking about a fast six four guy it's just someone who is tremendous buy-in to the team too i'm always big on that i know that's really vague and irrelevant in college football now but i i just i right putting this on the record now this is not a marcus major jinx situation okay. this is this is hot take buy this while it's still low. I don't even understand why it's still, I understand there's other people coming in. Right. But then, then Nick Anderson gets to be WR2. So I'm, I will free everyone from that take again, because it will get shared on every other podcast, but could not be higher on Nick Anderson. Well, that's fine. Except for the fact that Gavin Freeman's going to get all his snaps and just keep dropping the ball. So. Yeah. It's going to be a fun wide receiver um, battle to watch really. And you know, in the spring game, it's really not going to tell us too much because everyone's going to look good. Um, but I, I still think that just seeing who gets snaps and who's on what units, even though you really don't get to see that much in the spring, I think is a is a really fun thing to watch. Is there any, like in, on the offensive side, you know, tight end, you know, it's going to be fun to see Bauer Sharp. He's going to be a huge upgrade of what we had at tight end last year. Yes, that is a huge jab to you, Ty. Um, but really, really, people are going to talk about the offensive line. We'll see that battle is going to be made later in the summer into the fall. That's just how Beanbo does things. Um, no love for Jake Roberts there, you know, no, uh, the I'm Baylor sorry. transfer. Oh, yeah, dang. It, he didn't do anything at Baylor. What makes you think he's going to be a stellar game changer here in Oklahoma? Hey, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Devon Mitchell, you know, a little too green. Uh, he'll be fun. Probably. Devon Mitchell is going to be a, a lot of fun. But remember that this guy technically should be a high school senior. So exactly. Ooh. Yeah. Like, green. This guy's going to take some time. He's an extreme athlete. And we've always known that. We always know that he's just a crazy athlete. And he's got, you know, a great frame to work out. It's just going to take a little bit. So, yeah. I, I mean, he might have some plays in the first year. But it's not something where I think – I think like Bauer Sharp is the kind of guy that people aren't really thinking much of because where he came from, I don't even – I can't even think of it off the top of my head. Small school. Southeastern, oh, you know, you know Southeastern where he Louisiana. came from. You're trying mm. to hide your allegiance. <laughs> <laughs> whatever but still moral of the story is he, i think he's gonna be really really good and that's a guy that i'm gonna put a lot of stock in so um let's let's kind of move to defense i feel like the big question from the defense especially like going into the spring now with jacob lacy out is the interior of this defensive line what are we gonna do at that defensive tackle position um because we've got i feel like pretty big holes and obviously you see yep. it right now um, you've got, uh, us in the portal and we're on Philip Bleedy, um, from Indiana. He's going to be taking a visit here on April 12th, the week before the spring, um, spring game. Um, but like on the interior, like the guys that are starting right now, you have Dejon Terry at the nose tackle. And then the guy that was taking first team reps next to him at defensive tackle. Any guesses? Do, do you know, Bobby? For this year this or? Is no, that like, like in spring, in spring practice right now, um, looking at like TFB's practice report, who they have playing with the ones right now. Jeez. Uh, man, I, I, it, would it be too obvious to say David Stone? No, it isn't. It's not going to be, it's not going to be splashy. It's Ashton Sanders. Wow. Yes, exactly. This isn't a guy that we have, really haven't heard much. And obviously this is a guy that um a lot of people talked great about his character and his work ethic and everything but still like ashton sanders is you know a rising sophomore and it's got a lot or i guess he'd be a redshirt freshman um but he uh still got a lot to prove and whenever you go into sec and we keep on talking about winning the war in the trenches is so important in the sec Dejon terry fits that mold 
But having another guy next to him, that's what you really, really need. And Jacob Lacey, you know, with blood clots, that's something you don't mess around with. A guy who's got recurrent blood clots now, and he's going to be on have to be on anticoagulation. You just can't play with, whenever you're on that. You know, so it's, it's just a bummer for him. But we need somebody else. We need a big body defensive tackle to step up. And a guy like that I'm looking for, and we've been talking about this guy for like a couple of years now, and we, we keep on hoping, but we don't see anything. Can Grayson Halton be a guy that can come in and step up and be that? Because he has the body type. He has the athleticism of what he can be. Just We just haven't seen the production. Man, that defensive tackle room is a little scary for me moving on into this season. I, I mean, you got to get some work done in the portal. Uh, that's just kind of what it boils down to, I think. Um, Delta, awful, awful blow with the Lacey uh, medical retirement. But, I mean, it, it's just I, – I don't think you can just hope for guys to take a leap that haven't taken the leap yet. You have to bring in some competition there. You have to bring in some depth. Um, I felt like it worked relatively well for you last year, decently. You know, obviously bringing in Lacey the first time, bringing in guys. You know, Rondell, we got Moss, DJ Ray, Terry like, like okay, late too. DJ, like, yeah, he was a spring guy, and he popped up out of nowhere. He was a little. There's some collusion getting into that portal. Of course, of course. So it's like there's there are. I, I think there's work to be done. Um, obviously, landing the guy out of Indiana would be massive. Uh, no pun intended. To you know, but it's just I feel like I feel like you need to do some portal work rather than just hoping guys will take a leap. Um, so it's just it's just kind of nature of the business right now. Uh, they're recruiting well, but you need time for these guys to develop, um, you know, because they, they got the right guys in the building. They're just too young right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's it's true. And, like, you know, for the, the future of this team, you feel good about Jaden Jackson, David Stone, from what you're hearing right now, but it's just – True freshman as a defensive line, that's not quite it. Like we've we've got excitement moving in the future, but for the right now, there there are some pieces that I'm a little bit worried about. Other big stories that we can just slow, like really quickly touch on, like going into the spring, who's going to be the uh, other uh, linebacker next to Danny? Is it going to go back to Canick, or is Kip Lewis going to step and be like, "This is mine, and I'm not letting it go." Um, cheetah thing with Justin Harrington. Will he slot right back into it now that he has eligibility? But Kendall Dolby looked like a freaking great player. But even though Kendall Dolby isn't exactly what we really expect a cheetah to be, he was just so darn good at it that it's going to be interesting to see what we put out there. And then who's going to be cornerback two with Ginger Williams being out for the spring? Can a young guy look good in the spring game like a Josiah Wagner or like Makari Vickers? Um, Jacoby Johnson, you know, could we see some, someone make a big play to kind of get us excited moving on to the season? I've got to say the point, the linebacker battle is going to be very intriguing. And that's one that it's obviously not going to be settled in spring. It's not going to be, it might, it probably won't even be properly settled in fall. That's just something we're going to see throughout the season. I, I just, I feel like both of those guys, Kip Lewis, um, and, you know, Jaron Kanick, both are very competitive, high motor dudes who don't really let don't really get their dauber down too much in terms of fighting for a spot. Like when Kanick got, you know, beat out of that job, I felt like he responded well to that and fought back. Um, so I could see that being one of the more, probably the most competitive position, you know, across the board next mm -hmm. year. It's certainly going to be the. Right. And this is, I feel like this has been a talking point for us, probably for the entirety of the schooner pod. Well, not for the entirety of the schooner pod, but certainly the the past couple of years is, is that linebacker one is going to be crucial, um, especially as we have question marks. Obviously, a lot of this can can continue to get answered and uh, we'll get sorted out in the fall when, when we start to take snaps. But um, we always point to the linebackers, at least in recent years, is this pillar of okay they're going to be the foundation and it's certainly good to hear at least from my perspective as, as we talk about it the talking points that when we get into the backfield or more where's this guy going to fit because he's not necessarily the mold but he's just a, an athlete uh, versus maybe the big question marks that we have up front because that was not too impressive as a whole as a, as a group when it came um, to this sort of year in review so 
Yeah, I, I, I feel hopeful for Jaron Kanick because I feel like with the progression of linebackers, you see sparks, you see really big things. They're like, wow, that guy's good. You've seen that with Kanick the past couple of years. But you see a lot with young linebackers get in early. They go down wrong gaps. They lose an assignment. We've seen this so much with our linebackers of the past. Kenneth Murray, Exhibit A, and he's still doing it in the NFL. Um, and then Danny Stetson was like that too. Uh, but the way Danny Stetson progressed in terms of filling the right gap and not losing assignments, he took a huge jump last year, a ginormous jump. There's a big learning curve with it, and I, I feel like Canik can take that jump. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, and that's – you know, that's kind of the progression. It's it's a very complex defense. And, you know, Venables is just I feel like he's really good at coaching up his his linebackers. You've seen like you said, you saw it with Stutzman. Um, like that that right there, I feel like is just like such a, a finished product of a young, kind of immature backer into a guy who, you know, should be pretty high on NFL boards next year. Uh assuming everything goes goes to plan. So Mm -hmm. um yeah yeah and who's gonna be our kicker <laughs> gavin marshall Who knows oh, man that is that is breaking news so who's gonna be our kicker did that just break like just now no it's been for like okay two or three weeks maybe longer okay. <laughs> i i have not been glued to the boards or uh i don't know might be longer i don't even i can't even remember it's been a are while. you talking about the guy transferring out or, or someone transferring in our backup kicker is transferring out. I'm pretty sure oh, we, we got have a, the, new guy, a new guy that's coming in. We got the backup from Florida State. I yes, remember exactly. it was, we were talking about something random, and I announced it like live on the pod, and everyone was like, oh, it's okay. Yes. But yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I, yeah, as long as it's not Zach Schmidt, we'll be okay. Uh, Bobby, we want to talk a little bit about – um, Kevin Sperry and the drama that's going around with it. Do a quick little crew and corner to end this pod. Oh yeah, let's let's uh, let's hit the music. Jamison. Yes. What is this? The Jamison. This is a rooted corner with Jamison. Every morning dancing. Oh, oh, that's nice. I feel like it's obligatory to talk about Kevin Sperry right now, and there's some other things going on with Cruton, um, but this is the biggest hot topic, and Kevin Sperry transferring. From Carl Albert to Denton Geyer. Denton Geyer sounds familiar because that is Jackson Arnold Peyton Bowen's school. Um, and it's caused a lot of fans to start questioning is this our quarterback of the future? And the, and the reality of it is, I think he really enjoys OU and there's a reason he moved here, but their family, like the mom, was like still living in DFW. Like they needed to be back there. But I guarantee you, with the change in Lubby, there have been thoughts with Kevin Sperry of like, hey, like this was kind of my guy. And even though I really have like shown allegiance to Venables, you know, like you've seen like his mom post pictures on Twitter. You've seen Kevin Sperry po post a couple of edits, you know, since then, like he's still shown that he's on the like the boat right now of Oklahoma's recruiting class. But I guarantee you, with all of this going on, he started to think like, could I go elsewhere? You know? And to be completely frank, like it would be a bummer if we lost Kevin Sperry, but you know, there's so much talent at the quarterback position in this recruiting class that I feel like we can get by with it. But I, I, at the end of the day, if he decommitted and didn't end up signing at Oklahoma, I would be absolutely floored. So I, I'm not, I'm not going to buy into any of that hype. Yeah, I mean, it's not a transfer. It's not like it, I don't think it's that bad because he's already from Texas. It's not like mm -hmm. he was a long time Oki. What? I actually have a. I I was working on a bit, recurrent bit of mine uh, when I pulled up Kevin Sperry, and like all Texans, he is in fact from California originally. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Of see, and, and see, Brent Venables has said he doesn't like guys who hop around in different schools and everything. He wants, you know, to stick there and let your players grow with you. This guy's already changed three high schools, Bobby. 
In today's day and age, what makes you think he isn't going to hit the transfer portal right after his freshman year? Do we really want him, a guy who's going to transfer this many times in high school? I'm being extremely facetious. I I, I, I know you're being facetious. I know you're being facetious because I feel like I've said similar things in the past. (laughs) But but no, I see, I don't think it's, I don't, I think it's a different scenario. And look, I, I, I also think just flat out when you're a blue chip recruit, a uh, high level level quarterback recruit, if you don't see early playing time or a path to playing time, you're going to leave. That's that ha- that happened with Nick Evers. That'll happen with with Sperry. That'll probably happen with Hawkins. Uh, that's just that's just the way it goes. If you have a better opportunity to play ball, you're going to do it. Um, you have to be a very special, have, have a very special, unique mentality to accept that you're a backup, like General Booty. That guy knows he will never start anywhere in D1. So he hangs out at OU, makes a lot of money off of his uh, NIL, and uh, just kind of hangs hangs out, you know, get, get, keeps everyone warm. Um, it just, it's, it, you, you have to be a very like Davis Beverly type of guy to do that. So um, that to me doesn't scream blue chipper to me uh, or high he's level not like an crew. undisputed five star the most hyped guy in exactly the right. and the thing is like he's got he's got good spin to the ball like whenever you watch him like he looks the part um but he's in terms of national notoriety like he isn't that guy to where i feel like if he didn't immediately start his sophomore year he would be a guy wanting to transfer i don't think that's the mold of who he is so i mean Grand scheme of things, I I think that he's shown in the past a lot of pride towards Oklahoma and a lot of commitment towards us. And it's completely normal for a kid going into his senior year of high school to start to think, should I look elsewhere? Because there's been a lot of things that is completely normal. Even if you are dead set in this recruiting class um, that you're going to Oklahoma to be monogamous with Brent Venables only is extremely difficult i'm sure for these kids it really is because like once you commit to oklahoma you're not supposed to talk to anyone else i feel like that's extremely tough so having a little bit of doubt you know if that there's reports maybe he does have a little bit of doubt about his future at oklahoma i think that is completely normal i i just don't see the thing is would you and i'll credit like josh mcquiston of standard scoop by making me think of this and he said it too you know like Worse, college um, recruiting of quarterbacks is so much earlier than any other position groups. Defensive line, you can take it all the way to the end. They always have a spot for defensive lines. Quarterbacks, you see these guys committing sophomore, junior year of high school, and people get their quarterback early. We've had Kevin Sperry for a while. And so if you are going to go into your senior year and decommit and look for another spot, you better hope that someone's already been pulling the strings behind the scenes for you because there's not going to be as many openings as if you were a different position group. Yeah, and I, I feel like I think that's fair, like to to really be able to be committed for that long as a high schooler with the amount of change going on in college football across the board. I mean, a year ago, the Pac-12 existed, you know, um, we had no idea that we were going to look at expanding to 14 before we even got to our first 12 team play, play, playoff. Things are constantly changing. Things are constantly moving and it's hard to stay committed, you know, and that's not even, you know, taking into consideration the constant churn of, you know, coaching exit exits this year was particularly crazy. The landscape is always changing. So it's hard to expect commitment for that long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's completely fair. Um, Other than that, I feel like that's kind of the biggest thing talking about um kevin sperry it'll be cool to see um it looks like other other things that kind of been big Jaden nickens from millwood decommitting and i know that we had reports a couple weeks ago of um his father talking about him planning to attend img that is public knowledge at this point um so you know it's a bummer losing a guy right there um from Millwood, but once again, in terms of Brent Venables and the way that he conducts recruiting, if you get a guy who decommit this early in the season, you know, it's going to be okay because they can go and look elsewhere. What else you got, Bobby? Did I say something wrong? 
he played football last at Millwood, but then transferred, uh, played a, played a year at, I believe, Douglas, won a basketball championship, and is transferring again to IMG. Oh, well, okay. Well, I was completely so, wrong. <laughs> so. yeah, no, no. Well, it's a- these guys. I don't want any of them in my class if they're going to keep on decommitting and go different places. I'm I don't tired. even remember which place they're transferring <laughs> from. They're, they're transferring like crazy. <laughs> I It is sad, though, that in – NIL obviously is a great thing for players. And I'm not going to turn this into an NIL podcast. We're going to end this podcast soon. Um, But it is sad that there's a lot of people in high school sports that just wanted to go in and just get the reward of, you know, teaching, you know, teenagers how to play football and prepare them for great lessons in life. And there's a lot of them that have been thrown into the NIL of high school. There are legitimately high schools out there that are offering NIL packages for players to transfer to their schools. And that is extremely sad that it's gone down to the kids that are not even adults. I, I think that's well, wild. And I mean, they're trying to, they're trying to start it at like a high school super league. Like, I, I don't know if you've seen that, which is just, I, what are we doing here? I'm all for, you know, people that are 18 year old college kids that are adults now going out and making money off their name, image and likeness. That is a great thing. Trying to pry away a 14 year old to come to your high school is unbelievable. I mean, making money is good. Don't get me wrong. That's a positive. That's that's it's, it's great that they have the chance to do that off of their abilities that they've worked hard on, but they're losing their damn childhood here. You know, like, I, the moving schools in general is is tough. Having to start over is really tough, and I just I I I don't know. I'm not trying to sound old fashioned here, but it it's just too, I think it's too much. I think it's going to lead to some burnout. I think it's going to lead to a lot of loneliness and isolation in some some cases. Yeah, I just don't think that's the best. I wouldn't want to do that in high school. Even if I, you know, was, you know, some God athlete, which I wasn't. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I just, it's silly. I think it's silly. I don't know. Ty, he did play for USA football in Austria. So he, he was at once upon a time. No, no. I, athlete. I was transferring in middle school there. You know, I, I was <laughs> big brain. <laughs> I don't have really anything else to say. There's going to be guys that are going to be fun to watch in terms of the recruiting game moving into the season. But, you know, right now I'm not going to dive into it unless we really get some, like, heat of guys that, you know, are going to start to get commitments going on. I think the biggest name, just for Sooner fans, and you probably already heard about this, but the f- biggest and funnest name that you should watch and be your, like, your poster child of all um, fun in recruiting is Jonah Williams, linebacker, future cheetah um for uh out of galveston and he has a lot of predictions to ou he's the 11th player ranked in the on three industry rankings in the country um absolute stellar athlete multi-sport baseball and football um could even get drafted high um in baseball in the mlb draft before he goes to college so that's going to be the guy that everyone's going to freak out about in this class so he's going to be fun to watch yeah, absolutely. All right, we ready to wrap this thing up? Ty, Let's any final it. thoughts? No, it's it. I mean, we could do a, a short 30, 40 minute segment on how uh, it, it's increasingly becoming bread and circusy, but uh, I think we shall maybe save that for another time. For what? what for are you another referencing? time. For what? What are you referencing? Bread and bread, circus what? to what? Societal collapse in ancient Rome and its parallels. Oh. In the modern United States, and NIL for high schools being a sign of our imminent downfall. We'll see. <laughs> Ty heard NIL for Wait, high look, school. Look, I, I thought you just guys, like, I thought I thought I was in a group of people who had also studied Latin, but apparently not. No, no I am I a learned individual. <laughs> okay, whatever you say, Celticus. Uh, but yeah, no. Um, yeah, Ty, you heard NIL for high school and just like would have did an existential crisis there. You know? Yeah, it's, it's, society's <laughs> collapse and it's the end times. <laughs> oh goodness. All goodness. I care about is their 
their iPods and their vapes and their NIL. <laughs> they, they got an iPod Tic-tac-toe. that can vape. <laughs> they got an NIL for iPad or iPad vapes. They got an NIL for their vapes now. <laughs> the vape shops are giving the kids NIL. Do you think it'd be cool nowadays if you s- strapped an iPod Nano to your waistband? Do you think you'd be cool? You know, look, vintage is coming back, Jameson. I, I, can, I, think I, can I, might, see that. I think I might be into that. I, I actually think that's pretty great. Like, I think that mm-hmm. I think that could work. I I I, I think you're onto something. Okay, uh, I'm in. All right, so we're gonna take the next week to think about that, and we'll 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 launch our pit, pitch next week for uh, bringing back the nano. Uh, but until then, that is all we have for today. Uh, thank you all so much for listening. We'll be back. Uh, we'll be back soon to talk more OU football as we march towards the spring game. A little under a month here, guys. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. I, I need to figure out if I need to take up Jameson's mantle and do the hot dog contest. Yes, um, we need it. <laughs> we need a, We need a winner. We need we yeah. look if the if the beast from last time shows up, I, we're all anyone screwed. But if he's gone, I think I can out eat anybody. You need to train. Train yourself of the large dogs that they present to you. Make sure your esophagus is ready for it. On that note, we're ending the show. (laughs) See you all next time. Have a good one, everyone, and Boomer Sooner.